talk is a balloon hashing, a memory hard ha memory hard function providing provable protection against the sequential attacks by Ben Bonnet, Henry uh, Corrigan, Gibbs, uh, Stuart, uh, Shest, so the, uh, ah, Henry is going to give that talk. Thank you. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So I'm going to be talking about balloon hashing, uh, which is joint work with Dan and Stuart here. So just in summary, a balloon, balloon hashing is a new password hashing function. Um, it has sort of three desirable properties. Um, it's proven memory hard in a certain model that I'll describe. It uses a password independent data access pattern. Um, and I'll describe why these first two things are interesting in a second. And it's practically good. So it matches the performance of the best sort of heuristically secure memory hard functions. Um, so the idea is we're getting sort of provable security without having to pay much in terms of performance cost. So we actually use password hashing all over the place in our computer systems. Uh, you might use it without knowing it, right? You use it when you log into Gmail, or you unlock your phone, or you encrypt your hard disk, or encrypt a file, or log into your computer system. There's always some password hashing going on in the background here. Um, so the attack of interest that we're considering when we're designing password hashing functions is one where an attacker gets into your machine, maybe it's your server, and extracts a password file that looks like this. So it has a list of all the users on the system, it has a list of salts, which are just public random strings, and then a list of password hashes, which are some function of, of the password in the salt. Um, and the attacker's job is basically to run uh, through a list of dictionary words, uh, sort of popular passwords, maybe a billion of them, and for each user, try hashing the dictionary word with the salt and seeing if it, sh it matches what's in the password file. So the attacker is basically trying to compute this password hashing function a bunch of times at the, the least cost possible. So if this is what the attacker is trying to do, what we're trying to do as designers of password hashing functions is make the attacker work as hard as we possibly can. So a good password hashing function basically makes the attacker's job as costly as possible, subject to the constraint that you still need to be able to log into your system in, in a reasonable amount of time. So one way to sort of begin to formalize this uh, property is to say that if your authentication server, the server that's checking the password, can compute some number of hashes per dollar of computation, then an attacker, even one who's using sort of special purpose password cracking hardware, should only be able to compute something like an epsilon fraction more hashes per dollar of energy. So the, the property you want is that the attacker is running at the same level of efficiency as your sort of commodity x86 server I is running uh, for this password hashing function. So if you haven't seen it before, it turns out that conventional cryptographic hash functions like SHA-2 are very, very bad uh, by this metric. Um, so to try to convince you of that, uh, let me show you one chart. So this is, um, on the y-axis, the number of SHA-2 hashes you can compute uh, in billions per dollar of energy. And this is my server at Stanford. It computes like 100 billion per dollar. And it turns out with custom hardware that's, that's designed for Bitcoin mining, you can actually compute uh, about six orders of magnitude more SHA-2 hashes per dollar of energy than you can with an x86 server. So if you're using SHA-256 for password hashing, uh, you're in deep trouble because uh, with, with a device that you can buy for like 500 bucks on Amazon, you can compute a huge number of password hashes per dollar of energy. So this is why SHA-2 is bad. And to, to see why there is this big gap between what an x86 computer can do and special purpose hardware can do, uh, you just have to sort of think about what's going on in your machine when you're computing a cryptographic hash function. Um, so this is an x86 uh, die shot. It's uh, the sort of thing you have in your laptop or, or a server. It has some cores. It has a memory controller. Um, it has some I.O. stuff. And then it has a big L3 cache in the middle of the chip. And when you're computing a cryptographic hash function, a conventional cryptographic hash function, it turns out you're using almost none of this hardware, right? You're using, using basically only one tiny piece of one of the cores on your machine. Um, so an attacker who's building custom hardware to compute this function can basically throw away all of this other stuff and just uh, sort of put this little tiny piece of logic on, on the chip that, that he's building. So, so the special purpose hardware for, for password cracking sort of looks like this. It's a tiny piece of logic uh, sort of tiled across the chip. And since the cost to power this stuff is roughly proportional to, to its area on the chip, this is where the attacker gets this million X sort of efficiency savings. Um, so this is why special purpose hardware is way better at computing SHA-2 than your conventional uh, server is. And if you look at what people do for Bitcoin mining, this is exactly what they do. So this is a special purpose hardware for Bitcoin mining. It's just SHA-2 uh, circuitry sort of tiled across the chip as tightly as it, it can be fit. So this is where memory hardness comes in. Um, so if you haven't seen it before, a memory hard function is a function that uses a large amount of working space during its computation. 
Um, and the idea is that if the internal state size of your, your hashing function is big, then an attacker who's building special purpose hardware to compute it is going to have to put a lot of cash on whatever hardware they're building. And this basically decreases the advantage of special purpose hardware. So the idea is the attacker is running at the same cost as your x86 computer is running. Um, and the typical technique for building these functions is actually quite simple. You, you basically take your input, which is like a password, and use it to fill up a big buffer uh, with pseudo-random bytes. And then you mix up the state of the buffer in some special way. And then you extract the output of the function by, by sort of uh, maybe hashing together everything in the buffer. So this is sort of a generic description of how these things work. Um, so the idea is that without memory hardness, your hash function doesn't take very much logic to compute. If you use a memory hard password hashing function, it actually takes a lot of space to compute on, on your chip. You might need an entire memory hierarchy uh, just to store the state size, the, the, the internal state of the function. Okay, so that was, that was background on password hashing. I'm gonna spend the next couple of minutes talking about sort of the goals of this work before I discuss the algorithm. Um, and then at the end, I'll talk about sort of where, where this area is going. So the first goal, I mentioned memory hardness in an informal way, but I didn't really make it uh, concrete. So this is what I mean when I say a memory hard function. So it's a function that has some hardness parameter n, which you can think of as like the amount of space this function is gonna take up. And we'd like this function to require space s and time t such that the space-time product grows like n squared. So the idea is the function takes n blocks of space to compute, and it, you need that much space for about, um, you need n space for n time, basically. And everything here is in the random oracle model. So um, the intuition is that an adversary that's gonna try to save space, like uh, compute your function in a very small amount of space, is gonna have to take a lot of time uh, to do it. So anyone who tries to cheat on the space is gonna pay in time cost. Um, so the second goal of, of this, this work that we're doing is that the memory access pattern of the function shouldn't leak any information about the password being hashed. So remember the way these functions work is you fill up a big buffer and then you index into it in a sort of pseudo-random way. And the idea of this property is you don't want your indexing pattern to depend on the password because then you can be leaking bits of information about your password through side channels. Um, so we're just gonna stipulate that. Um, and then the third goal is, of course, this thing should be practical. So it should be basically as fast as, as the fastest hash functions out there for password hashing, or as, or as uh, performant, I should say, as the best hash functions out there. Um, so let me just mention some existing schemes for context. If, if you've heard of some password hashing functions, I'll try to explain why what we're doing is slightly different. So bcrypt and pbkdf2 are based on iterated hashing, and they're probably the most widely deployed password hashing functions in industry today. Um, but they're not memory hard, so they make no attempt to sort of uh, force the attacker to use a lot of space. Um, Scrypt was the first function, uh, password hashing function, to popularize this notion of memory hardness, um, but it uses a password-dependent memory access pattern. So you can leak bits of information about your password um, through side channel, through side channel information with Scrypt. Um, there's some new sort of theoretical work on password hashing functions that are secure against sort of more powerful adversaries that are using uh, sort of parallel computers uh, that I'm not, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about this at the end of the talk, but they're basically asymptotically good, but practically uh, not, not so practical. Um, and then there's these two functions, uh, one of which appeared at AsiaCrypt um, last year, so called Argon2i and Katena, which are, um, they're very practical hash functions, but both of them lack formal security analysis in one way or another. Um, so Argon2i had no security analysis, um, at least like formal proofs of security, and Katena had a flawed security proof, or at least for part of the proof was flawed. And it turned out that this um, sort of lack of, of formal security analysis for Argon uh, led to an attack that we found that's described in our paper, um, and I'll mention it briefly at the end of the talk. Um, okay, so now having sort of set up the problem, let me talk about the algorithm a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna show the, the pseudocode for the entire algorithm uh, in a second, but just to remind you what we're trying to do, we're trying to get these three properties. So proven memory hardness, so forcing the adversary to use a lot of space, at least in the random oracle model, um, use a password independent data access pattern, and have performance that's, that's basically uh, as good as you could ask for. Uh, okay, so, so it turns out the first property is really the, the hard one to get. The second two you can just get by construction. So all of the work went into devising the proof techniques and uh, basically making sure that we could simultaneously have the performance and the proven um, security properties. So let me show the pseudocode, and if you don't 
get the pseudocode, um, there's gonna, I'll show a picture, so it's schematic. But I'm gonna put the whole pseudocode up uh, just to show you that this is not a very complicated function to implement. So this is the entire balloon hashing algorithm. Um, as I mentioned, it takes in uh, password and assault, and then there's this sort of space cost parameter, which is how much space the, um, like the state of the algorithm is gonna take up. And then there's some number of rounds, which is essentially how many iterations of hashing you're gonna do. And those are the inputs to the function. And the way it works is you have this sort of internal state of the function, which is sort of n blocks of memory. Um, and as I mentioned, the way it works is you sort of first fill up um, the buffer with pseudo random bytes derived from the password and the salt just by hashing over and over. And then you mix up the state of the buffer. So for each round of mixing, for each block in the buffer, you sort of pick three blocks pseudo randomly based on the salt. And then you hash together um, the current block the previous block and these three other blocks. So you sort of hash together a bunch of stuff and that's what you write into the block that you're pointing at. And you just do this mixing sort of a, a bunch of times until you get tired and then you output the last block in the buffer as the output of the function. So as you can see, it's not uh, terribly complicated to implement this. Uh, you know, it's like a couple hours of C programming. So in case, oh yeah, and I should mention that this hash function here is just a conventional cryptographic hash function. You can think of it as, you know, SHA-256 or SHA-3, whatever, uh, your, or, you know, the, uh, you know, whichever hash function you like the best. Okay, so to show you a picture um, of the same thing, the way balloon hashing works is you take your salt and password and then you hash them together and use them to fill up a, a buffer of memory. So you sort of fill up n blocks of memory here. And then you mix up the buffer by sort of taking the prior block, the current block, and three pseudo random blocks and hashing them together, and then moving down the buffer and doing the same thing. So you just update the state of the buffer by hashing together sort of, um, you know, every block with, with some other things chosen in a special way. So you can think of this again as like a, a mode of operation for a cryptographic hash function. So you're taking a non-memory hard hash function like SHA-3 and lever leveraging it into uh, a memory hard hash function using this, this construction. Um, and so you can sort of see through this picture how if you start trying to cheat and use less space, you're gonna run into problems because if you start throwing away these blocks in the buffer, you might need them later on and then you'll have to go back and recompute them and you'll, you'll sort of spend a lot of time recomputing stuff uh, and not making progress. So that's sort of intuitively why, um, why you would get a memory hardness property out of this. Um, so I promised that this algorithm I just described would satisfy these three properties. Um, so let's see how we did. So the, the second and third um, you can get just by construction, just by inspecting the pseudocode of the algorithm, and then by implementing it and see how fast it runs. So again, the, the challenge is to actually prove something about um, what an adversary can do in terms of trying to cheat on, on the space usage. Um, so what we prove are a bunch of theorems of this flavor. Um, so this is a, an informal theorem, but the basic idea is that if you want to compute this function, so the n block uh, balloon function iterated for r rounds of hashing with high probability um, when delta equals seven, so this is just one of the constant parameters in the scheme. Uh, so if, you, if the adversary tries to, instead of using n blocks of space, tries to use like n over eight blocks of space, then the adversary's time is gonna be such that the space time product looks something like this. So let me sort of pull this out uh, so you can see what's going on here. Basically, the idea is that if you save a factor of eight in space, so a constant factor in space savings, causes a slowdown that's exponential in the number of rounds of hashing. So if you try to cheat by building some special purpose hardware that only has an eighth of the space that you're supposed to build or are supposed to use, then you get this massive blow up in the computation time. So you end up, it's not a very good tr uh, trade off because you're only saving a factor of eight in space, but you may be paying something very large in time. So for example, if you run 20 rounds of hashing, um, using a factor of eight less space causes the time to blow up by 60,000 X. So it goes from being very fast to compute to being very slow to compute. Um, and the idea of the proof, I'm not gonna have time to go into it here, um, but please check out the full version of the paper on ePrint if you're interested. The idea is, um, we basically write out a directed acyclic graph where each vertex in the graph represents a value that you compute at some point during the hash computation. And then edges in the graph represent dependencies between the different values that you need to compute. Um, and once you draw out that graph, you just basically have to argue about structural properties of the graph. And from those stru structural properties, you can deduce um, these sort of time space lower bounds here. 
Um, and the basic idea is, is, is called the pebbling argument, and it goes back to sort of the beginning of theoretical computer science, um, and has seen a bunch of really cool applications in crypto um, in the last couple of years. So even if you don't care about password hashing, uh, you should check out pebbling arguments because they're sort of a very nice, uh, very nice tool and set of ideas. Um, okay, so I, I, I promised that, that there would be, uh, you know, this thing would be sort of competitive with the best heuristically secure algorithm, so this is just a chart to show this. Um, so on the y-axis, this is how many hashes per second you can compute um, on one CPU core. And on the x-axis, it's showing how much memory you need to compute this function with no slowdown. And for comparison, I've put um, two non-memory hard sort of standard password hashing functions using um, sort of standard parameters that people use in practice. And on this graph, up and to the right is better because it means you're using more memory uh, with better performance. So argon2, uh, again, is sort of uh, a sort of best-in-class password hashing function that's memory hard. So this is argon2, um, the version that was around when we submitted the paper, um, instantiated with SHA-512 as its underlying, uh, SHA-2512 as its underlying cryptographic hash function. Um, so that's argon2, and balloon is slightly better. Um, in terms of performance, it, there's various reasons for this, but uh, basically it's just a little bit better than argon2 on this metric when both are instantiated with the same underlying cryptographic hash function. Um, so the way to read this chart is to say at like 10 hashes per second per core, how much memory can you fill? So you sort of draw a line over from here, and then you look and you see that um, you know, if you're using balloon, you can, you can force the adversary to use slightly more memory uh, given the same hashing rate. So, right, so the argon spec actually de uh, defines a non-standard cryptographic hash function that they recommend, and if you use that one, um, the performance of both, both password hashing functions is slightly better. Uh, but still, Balloon has a, like a slight edge over Argon2, even though um, Balloon has these like very um, rigorous security properties that you can prove about it. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I'd like to mention sort of a couple pieces of recent work that are sort of interesting and relevant. So one are um, parallel attacks on memory hard functions. So in a cr paper at Crypto this year, Joel Alwyn and Jeremiah Blocky show that in a parallel setting, when you have sort of a massively uh, multi-core computer, and you're trying to compute many instances of a uh, password hashing function in parallel, it's possible to execute a space-saving attack against any sort of memory hard function that uses a password-independent um, data access pattern. So these include argon, uh, argon2i and balloon and katena and basically any function that falls into this very large class of functions, they have an attack against it um, on a certain type of machine. So the, the thing that, that sort of important for understanding the practical implications of this is that the attack really is an asymptotic attack, so it only applies when the amount of memory that you're using is, is quite large, so say a gigabyte or two or three or four gigabytes of memory. Uh, whereas in practice, for password hashing, you're probably only gonna be using on the order of like tens of megabytes of memory. So it's not clear whether, whether this attack is gonna be sort of relevant for practice, but it's still very interesting from a theoretical perspective. Um, and the other thing to remember is that it basically requires um, a very sort of special purpose hardware that doesn't, doesn't yet exist. Uh, so it's not clear whether these attacks are a practical concern, but it's very interesting that um, in certain settings you can, you can basically attack any function of this type. Um, the other thing that people often ask about is like um, for a comparison with Argon2, because this is um, sort of the winner of a recent password hashing competition and has a really nice simple design um, and it's probably gonna see of widespread adoption in the sort of applied um, uh, sort of industry community. Um, and as I mentioned, it came out without any proof of memory hardness um, in any model. So, so it was basically heuristically secure. Um, and Argon2i is basically the variant that is comparable with Balloon that uses a data independent memory access pattern. Um, so we, we discuss Argon2 in the paper and in some depth. Uh, so as I mentioned, we demonstrate a practical attack against Argon2 um, that invalidates the original security properties that the designers claimed. Um, and they've since sort of changed the construction a little bit to try to defend against the attack. Um, but we also prove, using the same techniques we use to analyze Balloon, that much better attacks are not possible against Argon2. So we sort of attack it a little bit and then show that the attacks are not gonna get much better than that. Um, I should say though that I as far as sort of the memory hardness properties go, Balloon has, at least as far as we can prove, um, slightly stronger provable security properties than Argon2i does. But if you, you know, this is a sort of a question of, of, of religion, whether, whether provable security matters to you. 
If it does, you would, you would want to use something like Balloon. If you don't care, then, then, then there's lots of other options uh, out there. OK, so just to wrap up, I've tried to argue that um, memory hard password hashing functions are a good way to increase the cost of offline dictionary attacks against sort of stolen password files. Um, and Balloon is this pr uh, password hashing function that has these three nice properties. It has proven memory hardness properties in the random oracle model against uh, certain types of attacks. It uses a password independent data access pattern, so you're not leaking secrets through, through cache attacks. And it's fast enough for real world use, so it's competitive with the best password hashing functions out there. And for people who, who, um, who are using password hashing functions in industry, if you know anyone out there, um, most people are using PBKDF2, which is just iterated hashing. And if you take away any f anything from this talk, it's that there's better hash functions out there. It doesn't even matter which one you pick, whether it's balloon or something else. But basically, all of these modern password hashing functions are so much better than what people are using in practice. So uh, try to convince your friends to switch to a memory hard password hashing function. All right, that's it. Thanks. So any question? Thanks. So a couple of slides before you mentioned something about these parallel architectures with many cores and uh, shared memory. You said it, it doesn't quite exist, but isn't somehow what a GPU does right now? Like you can have thousands of cores, rather big memory that is shared across all of them. Yes. No. This, so this is, uh, it's not sort of SIMD uh, computation, which is what GPUs are better at. It could, you, it conceivably, you could, you could coerce a GPU into doing something like this. But uh, for the attack to work, basically the, the key thing is you're um, sort of shuffling very large buffers around the chip. And as far as I know, GPUs are not very good at this. Um, but it, I, it's totally conceivable that you could make such a thing work. OK, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? So your general construction had the parameter delta. Uh, your uh, theorem only dealt with delta equals 7. And earlier, you also mentioned in the pseudocode that delta equals 3. So what happens if you are using uh, a delta which is smaller than 7? Does it uh, become provably insecure, or you don't know how to prove it, or what? Uh, so the, the smallest delta you can pick for which the proof still works is 3. Any delta greater than that, uh, the proof still works, and it just changes the constant basically in front of, you get s times t is greater than or equal to constant times n squared. And the, the delta changes, um, so let me actually go back to see if I can go back to this. Uh, so there's two magic numbers here. So the first magic number is this one in front of the n squared, and the second magic number is this 8 here. And so as you change delta, um, this, this 8 and this constant change. So the bigger the delta is, the slower the thing runs, but the more favorable these, these numbers are. And for delta equals 2? Uh, delta equals 2, there's... We, we, it's an open problem, or you have uh, proof that it doesn't work? To say it's an open problem suggests that, uh, that there was a lot of effort uh, spent already. But yeah, I, we don't know how it works. The most okay. interesting case would actually be delta equals uh, 1. Sure. Would, would, would be nice. Um, but basically, the, 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 the proof relies on a combinatorial lemma, and that lemma doesn't seem to apply when delta Thanks. I have a lot of questions here. Yeah, I was wondering if you uh, uh, were familiar with uh, the paper I had that uh, you make security proof dependent on the hunting uh, password, pr uh, pass hunting password puzzle, uh, which I, from memory is 10 years ago, but I think it was a very similar structure. But you had the first there was a bit different. I mean, I, it was memory hard. But This is the one where you're hiding the number of iterations. That's also a secret. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the, the construction that was memory hard uh, there. It was on the emphasis in the paper, but it was definitely memory hard. So the, 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 the eviction time was proportional to the memory use. So it was that similar uh, memory filling stuff, which happened to be proportional to the, to the fixed constant uh, with, the, with the running time, which mm. was a secret. Ah, yeah. OK. So I, I only remember the first half of that, so I'll have to go back and look. Okay. Thanks for the pointer, though. Okay, do I have another question? Yeah. 
Akkor lesz szenszkvik a gen.